Are you guys ready for an awesome adventure this afternoon? <laughs> All right, today we're going to have an amazing adventure. We're going to explore Australia, New Zealand, Ecuador, but more importantly, we're going to explore the human spirit and the little things that allow groups of ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things together. They have traveled here from every corner of the world. For 10 non-stop days and nights, they must hike, mountain climb, paddle, ride, and race through some of the most captivating yet dangerous terrain in one of the last great wilderness areas on Earth. Now, before you think this is another crazy sports analogy, tell me if this doesn't describe your real life, if you didn't know I was describing a sport. All right, so I have small teams of men and women, and we're trying to make it through a seemingly endless series of checkpoints in pursuit of a nearly impossible goal, working against extreme time pressures and constantly changing market conditions with the goal of doing it better than anybody else in the industry. Welcome. Well, yes, welcome to, my, <laughs> welcome to my world. I'm honored to share with you what I've learned from some of the world's greatest extreme teammates about what it takes to get to the next highest peak, build and lead a world-class team that always gets to the next highest peak, time and time again, no matter how difficult the challenge, no matter how tough, how tough the climb. And I'll tell you the secret right off the bat. The higher you get on any mountain, what happens to the terrain? It gets steeper, right? So your ability to continue to get to the next highest peak is not just a matter of you trying harder as an individual. It's not just a matter of reaching up. It's a matter of reaching out to the people around you and creating what I call true human synergy. On the ridge to Eton Peak, the lead teams are learning that things are not always as they seem. There's a fake, false summit. It'll be soul destroying when they get there and realize they've only gone a third of the way and now need to descend and climb higher and higher than ever before. I remember that whole entire section being a very, very difficult one for me. I was pushed to my limit. It was incredibly hot. My feet hurt so, so, so bad. The terrain was really uneven and the section was a lot longer than we ever dreamed it was. So my expectations of having a nice short caving section and a run back to the beach became this six hour night marathon on really, really bad feet with a team right on our heels. And so there I am just crying and crying and I have to stop because there's a 1200 foot drop on both sides of this ridge line and I know I'm gonna die if I keep moving so I'm standing there crying. Finally, Mike realizes I'm not with them, comes trucking back up the ridge line and I'm just bracing for impact. And he stops and very calmly, he says something I'll never forget. He said, all right, Rob, uh, I got a wife and a daughter, and I know that you people have to do this. <laughs> and then he said, but there's a difference between people that are going to win the Eco Challenge and people that are going to lose the Eco Challenge. And it's not that people that are going to win the Eco Challenge aren't crying, because that's OK, and this is really hard. It's just that people that are gonna win this race are crying, and then he grabbed my hand and said, and they're walking. <laughs> the most interesting thing about that race is we weren't one of the teams picked to win. We had never raced together before, and we were merely above average athletes. But somehow, as we made our way that 500 kilometers, six nonstop days and nights together, side by side, on mountain bikes and native canoes, and on foot using just a map and compass to guide our way. We realized that we had something pretty special as a team. Our outcomes were so much greater than the sum of our individual strengths. And we weren't just walking side by side towards that common goal. We were figuratively and literally carrying one another. And at the end of the race, when we had shocked the endurance racing world and won the world championships, we realized we had discovered something pretty magical, a formula if you will, not just for winning adventure races, but for peak performance in every aspect of our lives. In other words, we had discovered how winning works. Prior to my racing with the best team in the world, all of us would just carry our own gear through the race, and if someone was slower, we just complained about them until they caught up. <laughs> just like in real life. Everyone carries their own weight, and people complain about them until they catch up. But the best team in the world had a different idea about how to do things. At the start line, Robert said, everybody take out all your stuff and put it in the middle. So everybody emptied out all their packs and all their gear and put it in the middle. And he looked at the course, and it started with a 75-mile run at 14,000 feet of elevation. 
Huge big run. He took all of the weight from the slowest runners and gave it to the best runners. He said, the goal on this team is for everybody to suffer equally. And that's how we came up with the concept of tow lines. Because why would we wait for the slowest person if we could just take them with us? Right? In any endurance race, and you guys know your business is an endurance race, right? It's a team sport, and it's an endurance race. In any endurance race, you're going to be the strong link, and you're going to be the weak link at some point, right? If you just embrace that with your team, and grab those tow lines from one another when you need them, and offer a tow line when you're strong, you're going to go a heck of a lot further, faster, together. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Life away from the training and the competition can be just as intense for Robin. You see, this is her real job as a firefighter. We can be called to anything at any time, and we have to be ready for that. And that's what I love about being a firefighter. But it's nice to know that as an athlete and as someone who is strong and has a good endurance background, that if the you-know-what does hit the fan, that <laughs> I'm going to be able to carry that ladder you know, to the window. I'm going to be able to carry a person out of there, and that's a good feeling. One thing I know for sure about commitment, commitment starts when the fun stops, right? We all start strong. We all start a project very strong. We're happy to be there. In our races, everyone's high-fiving each other, and we're all wearing matching outfits, and the sun's out, and we're having the best time. And then about 12 hours later, there's sideways hail. We're bleeding. We're covered with leeches. We want to strangle each other. That's when commitment starts, when the fun stops. And great leaders are also people that are ruled by the hope of success versus the fear of failure. Now, I learned this lesson the hard way from one of my buddies in the Ecuador Raid Galois, the French version of the Eco Challenge. It was the first time I raced with the best team in the world. And I was always fear of failure person. I had been my whole life. I would actually paddle, 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 turn around, paddle, 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 turn around. I did this hundreds of times, seeing where the French were. And finally, my buddy Ian, who was sitting behind me steering the boat, he was so annoyed by where my focus was. And he grabbed the top of my head, which was facing backwards, and he physically spun it back around to face forwards. And he leaned over, and in my ear, he said, winning is that way. <laughs> Great leaders that also embrace their setbacks when they do happen, because they do, as a chance to maybe learn something and excel in a different way. I had a, a relatively large setback for an athlete myself about five years ago. I discovered I had stage four osteoarthritis in both of my hips. And over the last four years, I've had four hip replacements. After my first hip replacement, I thought to myself, OK, what are you going to do with this? What do you got now? I, I knew I wasn't going to be a good adventure racer anymore, and I knew maybe I wasn't going to ever run again. But I thought to myself, what's your backup but never give up? And the idea for the Project Athena Foundation came to me. And what we do is we help survivors of medical or traumatic setbacks live an adventurous dream as part of their recovery. And it's been the neatest thing I've ever done. I'll share a couple quick shots with you guys. Twice a year, we do a rim-to-rim-to-rim -to -rim -to -rim trek across the Grand Canyon and back in two days with a bunch of fundraisers as well as four or five survivors. What was my next sport? What could I do with my setback and maybe excel in a different way? And I thought to myself, well, I've always been happiest in a boat. I've always felt strongest while I'm paddling. So I decided to set a big goal for myself. I applied to Guinness and asked if I could set the world record for the longest distance paddled by a female in 24 hours. And uh, last summer on the Yukon River, I did 516K in 24 hours. <laughs> and they sent me this really neat certificate that I, had to, uh, that I had to show you guys. So very often, a setback can be a pretty amazing thing. It can propel you forward much further than you ever dreamed if you just embrace it. This photo that you're looking at of a team of four people, it appears that it's a team just of four. That's the number one and number two team out in front of the race collaborating on the map. Then as we get to the finish line, we're only battling for number one and number two. So strategically, we think, see a world full of teammates instead of that world full of competitors. This game is called reverse arm wrestling. And here's how it's played. When I say one, two, three, go, you guys get into your official arm wrestling position on a leg, on a chair, whatever. And when I say one, two, three, go, and this is the most important part, your goal and your teammate's goal is not to do the standard arm wrestling where you push the other guy's arm down. Your goal and your teammate's goal is to get your own arm down to the table, chair, or leg, whatever it is. Get your own arm down as many times as you can in 30 seconds.
On your mark, get set, go! All right, stop, give yourselves a hand. All right, just out of curiosity, how many people got their own arm down five times or less? Five times or less, raise your hand. Ain't no shame in it. Five times or less. How many people got their own arm down more than 25 times in the 30 seconds? And I especially love doing this right after we talk about this taking everyone to the top of the podium with you and seeing a world full of teammates. And then I say, one, two, three, go, and half the room is like, oh. <laughs> You're about to blow an artery. <laughs> trying not to let your own teammate get their own arm down to the table. <laughs> it's so great, though, because it just shows us, and even the people that went back and forth right away, you probably got to admit that just for a second you had to turn off that little inner competitor, didn't you? You had to find that little switch and go, I got this game. But we're so wired to compete, which is a great thing. It's a fantastic, I'm the biggest competitor going. We're so wired to compete, and it's great, but every day you get to decide who you're competing with. Every single day you get to make that decision as a leader. Who really is my competition and who really should be? Why, why shouldn't this person be on my team? And we're also wired to see winning as being something mutually exclusive. In other words, for you to win, it entails everybody else losing. But the best leaders say, you know what, for me to win, I'm gonna get there better, stronger, faster if I take all these great people with me. Winning does not have to be mutually exclusive. This is the Japanese team in the 1997 Eco Challenge in Australia. They were about halfway through the pack, they were doing really well, and the girl on their team had ripped her Achilles tendon. And they had to get up and over a 3,000 meter mountain, and then hike 13 miles before they got into kayaks to paddle about 20 hours to the finish. And these guys said, we want to show the world how a Japanese team performs. Hi, uh, you aren't going to believe this. Team Eastwind taking turns carrying their female teammate up Bartle Frere. No lie, over. They had been carrying her on their back for about six hours. She got off and with her uh, walking stick was able to walk part way and they put her back on their back when they got to a steep, uh, another steep area, over. Oh. So I think this was a test for us to never give up, even under the toughest of odds. Most people couldn't even walk over Mount Bartle Freya. For them to carry that woman over that entire mountain, it's incredible. Here's what I love the most about that. As they were coming into the finish line, the guys that carried her aren't coming in going, sweet, look how awesome we are for carrying this chick. They come in with her on their shoulders. I love that. And it reminds me that as a leader, we don't achieve our highest levels by standing on our teammates' backs to get ahead. We achieve our greatest heights when we put our teammates on our shoulders. And as a leader, we don't inspire our teammates by getting out in front and showing them how awesome we are. We inspire our teammates by putting them on our shoulders and showing them how amazing they are. May you always have the courage to dare such mighty things that you can't accomplish them alone and the wisdom to put together the world-class teams that will push, pull, tug, toe, and carry one another to those finish lines. Are you guys ready to race? You guys ready to race? Five, four, three, two, one, go!